Hi, I'm Beth Meacham. I'm on the board of the Greensboro Free Library and we're pleased to have Brett Stanchu here this evening to share her book, Unstitched. And I didn't even know she was an author until I walked into the Galaxy Bookshop. <laughs> and at that point, I was dialoguing with her on other town issues. And I said, you're a multi-talented woman. And she said, I am. And I said, I don't know how you have time for everything. And she said she wakes up early in the morning. I don't think you sleep. Between, <laughs> between, between writing and doing numbers for the town and knitting um, and being a mom and a, an active individual in her community. She's just a bundle of energy. Thank you. So I, we look forward to your presentation today and I will leave it in your hands. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really nice of you. Um, thank you. So I'm, I'm just going to talk just for a little bit, just a little backstory about how I came to write on Stitch. And then I'm going to read just very briefly, just a, a little bit of the book. And, and then I'm happy to answer any questions, if any of you have any questions. And thank you for coming tonight. Yeah. So I particularly want to thank the Greensboro Free Library for having me here. I'm a huge fan of public libraries, and I have been for years. Yeah. And I particularly want to thank Beth Meacham as well, too. You know what? I could start. I could just wait until Nancy yeah, comes down. I can wait. My name is Brett Stanchu, and um, I'm just going to jump right in. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to speak a little bit about Unstitched, my book, and then um, I'm going to read just a very short amount, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. And thank you all for coming here, and thank you to the Greensboro Free Library for having me here as well, too. I'm a huge fan of public libraries, and I'm particularly grateful to Beth Meacham tonight for arranging this. So thank you, Beth. Um, glad to have you. It's a pleasure. And thank all of you for coming out in, in another one of our unusual events that we do now. <laughs> um, so the first thing that I want to say is that um, Unstitched is not a book that I originally set out to write. And the first book that I wrote was a novel. I was originally a novelist, and my initial love is really fiction. Um, but the circumstances of my life aligned in a certain way, and I had a catalyzing event that really made me write this book. Um, and the way I wrote it was a few years ago, I, I was a librarian myself. I was working in the Woodbury Community Library. And um, for those of you who know the library or don't know it, it's a one-room library um, in a town right near here in Woodbury. And it's a it's a one-room building that the town built a number of years ago with volunteer labor and some grant money. And it's surrounded by a lot of wilderness. And I was recently divorced. Um, I was working another job, and I really had a lot of, I put a lot of pressure on myself to do there, to do well. I was really interested in this job. And shortly after I started working there, I realized that someone was breaking in after hours. And it took me a little while to figure this out. And I, I realized it because on Monday mornings there was a scent of cigarette smoke in the library. And I started putting two and two together. And as you all know, being part of Greensboro, there's a rumor mill that circles around. And a, a room, there's a lot of rumors that circle around. And some of those rumors are true, and some of them aren't true. Oh, no. <laughs> Whoops, we'll come back to that one. <laughs> <laughs> but the important, the, the important thing to really know about this situation, and the, the book is not really about this man, but it's about what happened to me afterwards. And the important thing to know is it was rumored that he was using heroin, that he was an opioid user. And the other thing is I didn't want anything to do with this at all. I just wanted to go on with my own life, and I really didn't want to engage in the least. So I did everything I could to keep him out of, out of the space. I, I went to the police. It was a, a somewhat of a long story. And then eventually, in a very tragic way, he committed suicide. 
and the event just stunned me. And I didn't really know him, but I had this odd connection with him. And it was January when he died, and that night I drove back to my house, and I sat in my car, and I could look through the windows, and I could see my daughters, and I realized that I had probably done something that I shouldn't have done. And it made me stop my life and think really, really hard about what I was doing. And when I look back now at my life, I can see, or anybody's life, all kinds of things go through our lives. But only at certain times do we really stop and really pay attention. Because otherwise we couldn't live our lives. Our, our lives are filled up with so many mundane things. But it, at this moment, I knew that I had to do something differently and I had to really pay attention to what was going on in my life. And so the book Unstitched that I ended up writing comes out of the questions that I started asking after that night. And there's a line that I wrote in the book that I describe myself. And the line is, I was beginning to wonder if I was a minor character in a much larger story where the plot line wasn't clear to me. And I realized that I was part of, at that time, a much larger story around me that I hadn't really understood. I had been so consumed with my own life that I hadn't really seen fully anybody else around me. So what I did next as a librarian is I hosted a forum, as librarians tend to do. And I hosted it in the next town over in Hardwick. And my impetus behind this was to start opening up the conversation about opioid misuse because I knew that this was something that I didn't really understand. I, it was something that if I had understood, maybe I would have acted in a, a different way. So I invited in people who I thought would, would sort of fill out a mosaic to help me understand this. So I invited in um, staff from the Hardwick Health Center who were really helpful to me. Um, I invited in Chief Cochran, who was um, the Hardwick Police Chief at the time. I invited in EMS rescue workers from Hardwick Rescue. And then the fourth person on the panel was a man who was in recovery from opioid abuse. And I hadn't known him before. He'd been connected to me through the Hardwick Health Center. And I spoke with him on the phone and he agreed to come. And as this forum transpired that night, it was upstairs in the Memorial Building, and there were a lot of people there because we used to pack rooms. And it got very heated because people had very different ideas and very different understandings of what was happening. And eventually I stood up and I asked the man who was in recovery to speak. And the room got very, very quiet then. And he had a story that was so powerful to me and so eye-opening to me he had grown up in the area, and he had gone to prison for, um, for narcotics, and his first child had been born while he was in prison. And as he started speaking, it became clear to me and to everyone else that Chief Cochran, sitting beside him, had arrested him, and he had been the officer who had sent him to prison. And so the, the, st the conversation took on this incredibly interesting layer, because these two men then, they exchanged a laugh, they had a conversation, and he even talked about how being incarcerated had changed his life. And my book never argues, it, it's not political and it never argues for or against incarceration, but it did for me open up, here's a much wider story of what's happening. And the other thing that I really learned from him was how hard he had struggled to overcome his addiction. When he got out of prison, he had to leave town. He had to leave family members. He had to start his whole life over. And I had thought before this that I understood a lot of it about addiction, but I realized at that point that I really didn't, that there was so much that I didn't understand. And so out of, from that night, I realized that I had held a stigma against people that I had never really thought about. I hadn't really ever really examined that. And I had also used my persona as a librarian, that public persona, to hide behind, too. And so I had kept myself out of the story and used that as a kind of mask. And I began to think, maybe I should not have done that. 
So that's the beginning of, of how I came to write this book. There's a more complicated story. I sold a uh, proposal, and then I got some Vermont Arts Council money, a grant. I got some Vermont Humanities grant money, all of which I have to say was incredibly helpful to me. Um, so then it, in Unstitched, when I went to write it then, there's two themes in the book that unfold. And the first theme that I take the reader through is my process of educating myself is I really seek to understand addiction and as I really seek to lift that veil of stigma that covers it. And the book is divided into body, mind, and heart. And those are the, what I consider the three parts of a person. But it also mirrors the three parts of society too. We're all body, we're all mind, and we're all heart, which works out in a number of different ways. And the first question that I came to with the body, and this was a question that, that plagued me because it seems incredibly important, was whether or not addiction is a disease. And as I wrote this book, I went around and interviewed a number of people, and there were a number of different views on this. And for me, the question was so important because if addiction is a disease, the person who suffers from it has no volition. They're just under the spell of something else, but it also strips them of any volition then or any authority to recover. And I wasn't really sure about that, although clearly there's a chemical and a physical component. But the opposite of that as well, to say that addiction is just bad behavior and people who suffer from addiction should just be looked down upon, also seemed to me totally wrong too because anyone who is in those depths of addiction no longer wishes to be there. It's clearly no longer a vehicle just of volition. Um, so I spent a lot of time talking to Jerry Wilberg, who's a nurse practitioner at the Hardwick Health Center. And what she encouraged me to do is expand my understanding of disease. And I'm not even sure that disease is the right word anymore. But her metaphor, and it's a metaphor that's used frequently, is, is heart disease. So clearly some people have a genetic component to heart disease, but there's also a number of behaviors that also can contribute to it. A sedentary lifestyle, uh, a diet, things like that. But we also live in a culture that encourages heart disease as well, too. And the more I thought about this, the more I realized it was impossible to look at addiction just as an individual and not look at the whole society around it. To just segment out people and penalize them to me seemed wrong. It seemed to be missing the deeper understanding of what was going on there. So then along those lines, the book then goes into the section I call mind. And I spent a fair amount of time researching the history of disease. And then I also reached out to a number of people who were involved professionally in one way or another with addiction. So Cochran is in there, Hardwick Health Center staff is in there, Christina Nolan, who was the US attorney, is also in there. But all of these people all emphasize for me, uh, they all emphasize for me that addiction is a very long story with a very, very long history and that we shouldn't look at it just in a snapshot of a time period, but we had to look at how did we get to this point? Look at that in a larger time and a larger space. And the last set of interviews that I did that went all through the book were from people who are in recovery and then from a, a couple who tragically lost their daughter. Um, and I interviewed a bunch of other people, but the interviews I ended up choosing I chose because the stories were all, they were all slightly different. They had a slightly different demographic, but the people were all very self-reflective as well too, and had a, what I considered a really deep understanding of their lives. They'd gone through a lot, and to me, they were just incredibly courageous in sharing their stories with me. So one of those stories is Shauna Shepard, who um, works at the Hardwick Health Center. She grew up in Hardwick, and in many ways she might not look very different than me. She's a white woman, she's a little younger than I am, but she had a life that was very different from the get-go. 
And the path that her life took was a very different path than my life took. And at the very end, after I spoke to her, at the very last time that we spoke, I asked her what she would say to someone who was struggling with addiction. And she thought a long time, and she finally said, recovery is possible. And it seems like that's maybe just three little words, but it's three words that open up into a whole hopeful sentiment that so much of addiction is just so dark and so discouraging and terrible things happen. There's no question about that. But Shada always encouraged me to look and see there is another side to that and there is a wider dimension to who we are as people. And then the second theme that goes through my book is a very personal theme. Um, and when I first wrote the book, I, I thought long and hard about what kind of book I was going to write. And I, I could have written a book that was very um, clinical, that was very a distant point of view. And originally I was just going to put a little bit of my story in there because I struggled with addiction for years. And I thought I would put that in as just sort of, well, I've got a little bit of knowledge about it, as though it gave me a kind of authority. But in the end, I put an awful lot of my story in there because I realized that I was in the story from the very beginning, whether I knew it or not. I was an active participant. And for me to just cut myself out of it seemed really wrong. And I, I struggled for years with alcoholism, and at the very end of that, seemingly by random, I picked up a book in a library, and our libraries, they're small, there's not a huge selection, and I had little kids at the time, and I just grabbed a book to read. And as if kind of by chance, I read a, a chapter in there about habits. And my life again was in a particular place where I read this and I realized I could change my habits. I could change who I am as a person if I did it step by step by step. And the book is by Charles Duhigg. It's not even a book I would usually read, but miraculously it came my way. And in here he writes about what he calls is a personal scum line. And by the time I began to write this book, I thought I had hit that point in my life, as many people hit that point in their life. But I realized I'd hit it again when I turned my back on this stranger. And that was, again, another point at which I was unwilling to go any further. And I had to say, I'm part of this story. Um, and then on a, on a deeper level from there, while I was writing this book, I picked up a, I was in Maine with my family, and I picked up a book on anthropology. Um, written by an anthropologist who was working in Papua New Guinea. And in here he quotes a line from Marx that I later looked up. And the line is, is this. And Marx starts out with men, but I'm just going to put people in there. And he writes, people make their own history, but they do not make it as they please. They do not make it under self-selected circumstances, but under circumstances existing already, given and transmitted from the past. And I kept thinking about that book, and I kept thinking about that line. And I realized it applied perfectly to my life, but it applied to everybody else's life that I knew. We're born into circumstances we don't choose. We're born into a particular body. We're born into a particular time. We're born into a particular childhood. And so this goes back to what I was originally, what I originally began thinking about. Um, when I hit that point, I realized there was a wave of my past that had been coming at me all those years, coming across the water. And writing this book made me realize, even though I saw myself that night isolated, totally separate from the rest of the world, I wasn't. I was completely mistaken. I was part of this incredibly complicated story. And if I was ever going to understand it, I couldn't understand it by myself. If I was ever going to ch make a change in my life, I had to make that through other people. And so in the end, those were the questions that came out of my book. I came to a few answers and I came to a few ways of looking at the world as I wrote through it. 
Um, and then the last thing that I guess I want, there's two more things that I want to say about the book before I read just for a moment. The original title of the book was A Good and Hard Place. And I still feel that's a really good title for the book because the book is inherently about Vermont. And Vermont is a really good place to live in and it's also a really hard place to live in. But it also is a metaphor for who we are as people too. We live in good times, we also live in really hard times too. And so the book, while it has really, really hard things in it that are really difficult, also has really good things in it too. Because for me to only write about this one part also seemed false as well too. And then the last thing I want to say about the book is, it, it's a, I consider it a, a creative nonfiction book. I changed a number of the names in the book. Anyone's name who I mentioned tonight is their actual name. And I, I switched around time and I did a few other things like that. Um, and the stories that I write in this book are just in some ways not so much snapshots of people. People live very complicated lives. Like Shauna Shepard, who I spoke about, I write about her in a couple chapters. Her life is infinitely more complex. I mean, a book could never encompass her story. But what literature does is, is take a narrowed down or an intensified vision of people's stories. And there's this saying that literature is both windows and, and mirrors, right? So I really came to understand that when I wrote this book because I could, I could see as I wrote, as I hope people who read my book will see, there's a mirror that they can see themselves in. But really, I'm hoping the book also serves as a window too, where we can open it up and see people who maybe we never saw before and see in a different way and in a wider way. And I think that's the power of literature. I think we've always needed it, but I think we really, really need it right now. Yeah. And so then the last I'm going to do here is I'm just going to read very briefly and then I'm happy to take any questions that anybody has. Um, this is at the end, just so you can get a sense of what my writing's like. Um, this is at the end of chapter five and I'm walking home from the Hardwick Diner. This was written pre-pandemic back when people just did things like this. <laughs> um, and I'd been speaking with uh, Katie Whitaker, who was a nurse practitioner, who really was a, a huge influence on me and a very positive person. When I left our house that morning, my daughter Molly was mixing dough for cinnamon rose, rolls and listening to Stephen Colbert. And I longed to be in our warm, lemon yellow kitchen, sweetly fragrant with the yeasty scent of rising dough. I cut through the cemetery. As I hurried through the sleet, I remembered the winter Molly progressed from crawling to walking. Strapped for income, I took a temporary job working for the 2000 census, collecting data in nearby hard scrabble North Wolcott. On one stop along a dirt road, an older woman invited me in from the cold. Her mobile home was situated on a ridge. The, wind, the snow wind sculptured so high around the trailer that not much of the rust-streaked metal was visible. Clutching my census clipboard, I followed her down a hall reeking of ripe garbage. Our trainer had warned us folks would view a government employee and a list of checklist of questions with skepticism and sometimes outright hostility. What I hadn't expected to find were lonely people hungry for company at the tail end of a bitter winter. In the kitchen, her husband sat in a wheelchair beside a window with a view of a snow-covered field in the distant mountains. On the kitchen table was a paper plate printed with green holly and bright red berries. Her hands trembling a little, the woman painstakingly removed saran wrap from the plate. Beneath it lay a half dozen white star cookies sprinkled with pink and purple sugar crystals. The woman urged me to try one. She offered to put on the kettle and make tea. Politely, I refused both. 
I was there on business with a stack of forms and dozens of stops to finish before I headed home. I couldn't afford to linger. Through the bare branches of trees, I saw the red tin of our barn roof, where the footpath wound through the hydrangeas and joined our lawn. I paused, my soaked jacket clinging to my shoulders and body. Nearly two decades and a lot of living later, my refusal of that cookie and cup of tea shamed me. Standing in what promised to be an all day, maybe days long frigid rain, I knew Katie Whitaker would have relished the cookie. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. <laughs> Shauna drew blood from me this morning. Oh, did she really? <laughs> she is an amazing person. I didn't get into quite that much. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, but that's interesting. No. She's been, she, she came to me through the Hardwick Health Center. She was uh, one of the people Jerry Wilberg suggested I speak to. And um, she came and met me at my house a number of times and shared a story that was, uh, her, her past and her background was just amazing to me, what she had gone through and her ruggedness and her, her courage in sharing that with me and allowing me to use her name was amazing to me. Yeah, so. Brave woman. She's very brave, yeah. 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 But she's seen a lot as a nurse, or as a nurse practitioner, or nurse, whatever. I think they probably see quite a bit going through the health center there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a real calling. I mean, it's interesting because a lot of people who are in recovery, in one way or another, end up in the medical field. Yeah. It's yeah, not... as practitioners. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's the way psychiatrists are often seen as people who need their own mm -hmm. skills. <laughs> well, we often go into our own weaknesses. <laughs> Uh, How many children do you have? I have two daughters. My older daughter's 23, and my younger daughter just turned 17. What are they doing now? My older daughter um, is also a medical assistant. She works at Stowe Family Practice, and she just got her EMT license. She's hoping to go to nursing school. My younger daughter is still in high school, ready to be done, and she works at Willie's this summer. So, really? oh, so you may see her there. She's yeah. at Hazen? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Which is its own story. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Yeah. I think it's a tough time to be a kid in a pandemic, honestly. It, you know, uh, how, how do you in, interpret the, how, that you first got in, into alcohol problem? What, what caused that? Oh, that's actually a very interesting question. I would say, I would say genetically, I was driven that way. Um, I would also say that I grew up in a family of drinkers, and um, my father had us start drinking wine at like age 12. Um, and I would say that it became a habit that I never really thought about at all. And, uh, and by the time it really had its claws in me, it, it was... It was an entrenched habit at that point. Yeah. I, my, uh, some of my theory about addiction and just sort of like my observance is people often just drift into their, they end up drifting into places in their lives without really being aware of it. I mean, how much of our lives do we really actually choose, right? I, I think that's, ad addiction is one of those, right? And people obviously do make choices in their lives and some people are much more, uh, self-observant about their lives. But often I, I think addiction just kind of creeps up on people. It, it's a real kind of ill health that, that does creep up that way. Did you decide it was a disease? I think it, I, I do not think addiction in many ways is a disease like a cold. I think there's a real, um, there's a real chemical component, especially for someone who suffers like from opioid abuse, there's no question in my mind, these are enormously addictive drugs. I mean, alcohol is very addictive, but a lot of these other drugs are just profoundly addictive. 
Um, but I, I don't think it's that simple. And I think that, I think we live in a very ill society in many ways that promotes ill health, that we could do a lot more to prevent that. Yeah. Uh, I had an observation. Yeah, let's hear um, it. That noticed, I, I, actually, what you just read made me uh, reflect on it that I've noticed it before, but I hadn't really thought of it consciously, which is your use of color in your writing. Mm -hmm. Like, you put a lot of color, like <laughs> literal color, descriptions of color in your writing. It's really interesting. I really like it. Um, it's just an observation. Uh, I wonder if you... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I mean, I, I could turn that into a question, but I have another question I'm more interested in, but maybe... If I could ask two questions. One okay. is, like, yes, in fact, that's true. I do. Yes. Yeah, okay. like, I'm curious about your relationship to color. Okay. And then the other question is relating to some of your your comments about like um, choice and personal choice and lack thereof or the circumstance. Yeah. And it's really a simple and very pointed question. Okay. Um, which is, do you believe in free will? I don't think it's black and right. No. By any means, I don't. I, I wish I did. Yeah, but it's I another color thing. <laughs> <laughs> it's the color thing. I, I don't, honestly. And yeah. I, I think that we really want to believe in free will, that yeah. we really want to believe we are making decisions that aren't colored, that are unbiased, right? I'm not totally convinced of that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I sometimes wonder... Say I grew up like in the deep south in like a really like a staunchly different politically driven family. Maybe I would have made very different lot decisions in my life. But I grew up in a family where my dad taught great books. My mother was a nurse. The very left leaning. Right. You know, I. I don't think I can ever separate my decisions from that. It's, as much as I might examine them and think about them. Yeah. But on the other hand, sometimes people really make, they clearly make decisions. I really made a decision at one point. I was going to stop drinking. It took me years to get that point. But when I made that decision, I never went back on it, ever. And so that's a decision that I made. Yeah. So. You mentioned decisions that you made regarding this individual breaking into the library yeah. too, and, and that you regretted to, to some extent. Was there a conflict between kind of what you wish you had done as a librarian responsible for an organization as opposed to an individual or a recovering addict or, or you know, is there a conflict there? That's an interesting question. Yeah. Do you have a responsibility to the building, really, and to I, the safety? I, and all I that. did, and yeah. in fact, that's how I that's how I described it to myself at the time. Yeah. Because the primary people in my library at that time were children and elderly women. Almost ninety eight percent of my patrons were that way, and that's how that's how I justified that decision to me. Uh, but the truth is, I made that decision based on my own personal life. So. While he was breaking into the library, my ex-husband was breaking into my house. Oh, wow. And I was unable to separate those two yeah. by any means. And maybe professionally I should have been able to do it, but I just could not. And I wasn't even totally aware of it at the time. Yeah. But honestly, sometimes people make decisions, you know, that are... Sometimes maybe you make decisions for the good of a whole, how can how can we do that though and like cast out someone who's an individual who needs help? This is another question I've gone around and around in my head about, right? I mean, do we throw people out who need help because the whole justifies that? I, I no longer think that's a sign of a, a moral action. Yeah. If you had to do it over again, what would you have done? I I so uh, there was one, one scene um, where I passed him in the village, and I, he clearly knew who I was, and I knew that just from him looking at me, and that's how I figured out who he was, by him looking at me. I, I would have gone to him and said something, and maybe the same outcome would have happened, because his life was far more, I was one tiny little piece in his life, and he had a much more complex life. Um, but nonetheless, I, I probably would have left the door unlocked. I would have made a different choice. Yeah. 
where do you think your your ex-husband went off the rails? <laughs> <laughs> that one I can't really answer because I don't know the answer to that one. <laughs> but if um, if anybody does know the answer to that one, <laughs> I have been struggling for years. So, but to to, to sort of answer that question. Often with addiction, I mean, and this is endemic, not just with addiction, all through our society. Mental illness in all kinds of forms goes through our society that's never really addressed, that's never really diagnosed, you know, that just comes and goes, right? And we, we have a fair amount of tolerance of that. We don't maybe help people as much as we could. Yeah. 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 I, I mean, I just was, I think, you know, I think it's so many... I don't know. It occurs to me that a certain amount of what we would term mental illness, this is to speak nothing of your personal circumstances, it, 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 you know, okay. but a certain amount of what we would term mental illness and a certain and, and certainly a lot of what we call addiction yeah. to me seem like entirely rational, insane responses to yeah. of the society that we inhabit, yeah. <laughs> frankly. Yeah. And yes. Therein lies yes. where it gets really sticky and yes. challenging to sort of disentangle. Yes. those conditions from the, you know, the, the, the world that we all somehow need to have to navigate. Right. Know, which I, is crazy. It, it is. And the <laughs> thing is, like with mental illness, right, and we don't need to talk about my ex-husband, but in all of this, there's elements of real truth and elements of just yeah. incredible clarity, right? Yes. And I think that goes back to, it really made me start looking at where we live, not just in Vermont, but where we are in the American democracy at this point, right? What are the values that we hold and where are we being driven? What are we teaching our kids, right? There's so much that drives us away from really what would be healthier and happier people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, did you, um, you just quit drinking cold turkey? You didn't join AA or have support from other folks? Or? Yes, but I never recommend ever that people do it that way, oh. ever. And the reason I don't is it's really hard and people don't usually succeed. I, honestly, if you, for anybody who has an addiction problem, just reach out, reach out and get help. And part of that is the stigma against addiction, mm -hmm. but it's so much easier to go get help. I did everything as I've done in my life backwards. Like now I've started going to recovery groups. I've been in recovery for over a decade, right? And like now I start, that's like, and maybe that's just the way my life worked out. But like, if I did this 10 years ago, that would have been more helpful, you know? Yeah. And the people who are involved in recovery, in one, they're, they're all interesting, fascinating, multi-talented people. Some of the people you won't like, some of the people it's like anyone else, right? Yeah. Is there an AA for Drug addiction or oh yeah, there's all kinds of there's like NA and recovery groups and oh yeah, there's yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you ever think of turning to religion, helping a, a minister or a priest? No, I didn't. My um, uh, my, my mother was the daughter of a Lutheran minister and um, she, as an adult, had an abhorrence of the church, and I. I she really disliked the church. And I think that inevitably, again, I feel like this would have been a smarter path. <laughs> but again, you have these preconceptions in your head that take forever to get out of. Yeah. I want to build on this gentleman's point. Um, as a college student, I spent a summer in uh, as an uh, a ward attendant in a state hospital, oh. and um, we had the feeling that there was a very thin line between those of us on the outside yeah. and those on the inside. Yeah, not not true of some of them. Some of them were, were right. not well. Right, but there are others that uh, right. seem very thin line. Right, I I would concur with that. Actually, my mother worked in the psychiatric ward for years. Yeah, yeah. And this is something I think our society, as you say, hasn't really dealt with. Yes. Um, I think, you know, there are a lot of ways at, at dealing with uh, gun violence. Yeah. And I think a lot of people are right that, that part of this is um, 
early upbringing and, and yeah. uh, psychiatric. It's not just just guns and hunting and stuff. But right. It's also some very serious um, adjustment issues. Yeah. As youngsters. Yeah. Yeah, I that would we agree. We haven't begun to deal with it because it's so expensive. As one example, or yeah. w w through lack of understanding, whether ignorance, but also the cost. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, it's, it's also very interesting, like, who drives that conversation. So, like, for instance, when you start looking at narcotics, right, there's a huge amount of, like, black market narcotics, right, which is illegal, right? But then you can also look at this whole opioid epidemic as in many ways driven by legal pharmaceuticals, right? I mean, once you follow that money chain, I mean... It, it's very illuminating about what the real values of society are, who's really held accountable, and what the real effects of those are. Yeah, I mean. Well, Big Pharma has a lot to answer for. They have a lot to answer for that they may but, or may but not with ever really. The, the money they have made, meaning their influence on Congress. Yes. Mm -hmm. you know, makes it very difficult. Yes, I agree. I totally concur with that. Yeah. Did you already say where you grew up? Uh, I grew up in New Mexico and then in New Hampshire. Yeah. So. And from New Hampshire, you came to Vermont. Right? I did. I went to Marlboro College, which is where <laughs> <laughs> these two people went, which is now sadly closed. <laughs> yes. So, Emily? Um, I haven't read your book yet. I'm so sorry. That's totally fine. It's, it's not a requirement I to read. It. I'm excited <laughs> to read it. But part of the title is How Communities Heal. Yep. And I'm curious, maybe it says it in your book, but yep. I'm curious, like, through your talking with people, yep. how families have healed, like, families with addiction, families who have lost people to addiction. Yep. I imagine you've been doing different speaking tours, and so maybe you have yep. new information um, of like how people do find that healing. First, I didn't actually write the subtitle that was pushed on me. <laughs> I'm going to make a confession here. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> I still like the good and hard place one. That was cool. That was that. That was that. Was how you wanted. Yeah. That was the title I wanted, but you know, that fits me too, but I like on Stitch too. Um, so that's a really good question. And so my observation about healing is it, it's never a sanctimonious thing. It's never really, we have this notion often that things will someday be okay. And really the reality is that's maybe not really ever going to happen, right? But um, an example I could give is of Don and Greg Tatro, right? So they're really fairly well known now. Uh, they live in Johnson, and their daughter um, died of a drug overdose in a way that it's incredibly, really violent, I'll just be really honest, that I write about. Um, and they did everything possible, I mean, everything possible to save their daughter. They would have, they would have laid down their life for her, their daughter, and yet she died. And Almost immediately after she died, they felt they had to do something, that they couldn't just be quiet. And so they now started Jenna's House, which is, they've gotten tons of money. They essentially bought an abandoned church. And when I originally went and visited them, I'm like, oh my God, this is such a pipe dream because it was just all dusty and empty. I mean, and they were doing like a yard sale and I'm like, I don't see how this is going to work. But it did work. I mean, I mean, they, they're phenomenal at what they're doing. Where, where is that? In Johnson. But their way forward was community driven. It was very passionately driven. It's a fantastic metaphor because it comes out of the church, right? It's a very spiritual bent on their part. Um, but their idea was to share what their story was and not to be ashamed of their daughter and to validate her existence and say, she's suffered. The story really is about human suffering, right? 
and acknowledging that she suffered and acknowledging that other people suffer and what's the way in which individually, piece by piece, we can help other people. Yeah. So that's one little piece of what I write about. So yeah. what is the house, Jenna's house? So Jenna's house, they bought, when you go into Johnson, go, you know, you go down there, mm -hmm. it was originally a, a, a Catholic church that um, is kind of tucked over on St. John Street. It's kind of right off Route 15 there. You can't see it, but it's just a little bit off there. Um, and they used her insurance, her life insurance money to buy it. And um, I, I mean, the story is, is tragic in so many ways, but also what they've done is amazing. So they bought that and their idea was to help other people who were in need. And they ended up buying another property in town too. So they have, they have a recovery center there um, but what they really wanted to do was sober housing. So, and they started with women. So women who are recovering from uh, opioid abuse will come and stay there. They'll help them get better. They'll help them find work. Their whole bent is to help them find meaningful lives. And I mean, so for instance, like I was in the Brattleboro Recovery Center a few weeks ago, a woman just wandered in, right? She, she, been in, in jail, she'd been released, she was part of um, the Brattleboro retreat, but she had been given by the state a motel room, and she'd been given a room. That was essentially it, and it was up to her to t recover from this terrible addiction. She had to find free food. She didn't even have a fork to her name. She's like, do you think you could give me a plastic fork? And for me, like, again, it's like, we don't realize like how profound this addiction is and how it strips people of everything. And so the odds are running against her in so many ways. I mean, in so many ways, right? But if she's gonna get better, she's going to need other people to give her a fork and to give her food and to help her find a job. And so that's part of what I write in there. That's what Jenna's house does. That's what they do. That is, that is their driving mission. Yeah. And we'll see how it works out. Yeah. How, how long has it been in operation? Oh, not very long. Just a few years. Yeah. Yeah, they had their grand opening, like, just within the last year. Um, it, they've had received an enormous amount of state support. I mean, just political support because... The interesting thing, I mean, Don and Greg Tatro are also, I mean, they run GW Tatro Construction, right? Um, so they have business experience, but they're just a family. It's not like they, this was their mission, right? So they're the most likable couple imaginable, right? Um, and that's, I forget what my train of thought here was. That's part of like, that's part of their drive is let's just move forward as people. Let's just try to do something moving forward. but. Jenna's house came out of the private sector. It didn't come out of the public sector, which I think is, it'll be very interesting to see how this works. Um, and I think that's been part of the real interest there as well, too. Um, so it's not, although they've received a lot of grant money and enormous amounts of donations, they are their own private entity. Yeah. But <laughs> they're a nonprofit. They're oh, yeah, they're a nonprofit. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But they're not, they're not under the, the health department. Yeah. yeah. Relation to the community is always a very difficult uh, uh, arrangement in something like that. You may be aware, some years back, they talked about turning the uh, uh, Lakeview Inn into a halfway house oh, for yeah. uh, people with uh, right. emotional difficulty. Right. And there were enough people opposed to it and yeah. thought how it would affect the town. And, and right. The, it's, it's a tough right. time. Right. Mm -hmm. Remember how that, that was, was turned mm -hmm. down by the town, basically. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Interesting. That was, uh, yeah. 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 Well, that was a good question to end on, because that's a, a positive one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. Yeah. Yes,